בשם השם נעשה ונצליח שיעור תורה. Uh, ברוכים הבאים, we're uh, starting a new week, although it's a uh, tragic way to start a new week. Um, this is uh, what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, and uh, although we usually have our uh, series of Jewish Ashkafa, uh, we're uh, going to uh, do something a little bit different for the uh, Ilui Nishmat uh, of all of the precious Neshamot that were uh, taken from us. Uh, all of the 45 tzaddikim that uh, died in the tragedy in uh, Anlag Baomer in Meron at the uh, grave site of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Uh, we're uh, going to talk about that and uh, also learn from it, Bezat Hashem. Uh, so uh, the uh, Shu Bezat Hashem will be for uh, Ilui Nishmat. We're going to read out each one of their names. Uh, Rabbi Shimon Matiun. Rab David Kraus, Rab Shragai Gestetnil, uh, Rab Israel Anakva, Rab Simcha Bumnim uh, Diskind, Rab Menachem Asher Zek, Rab Eliezer Tzvi Yosef, Rab Chanoch Slod, Rab Eliezer Goldberg, Rab Chaim Ozer Seil, Rab Yonatan Chevroni, Rabbi Yehuda Leib Ruben, Rabbi Elazar Gefner, Rabbi Chanoch Solad, Rabbi Chur Chaim Rok, Yosef Amram Taub, Eliyahu Cohen, Menachem Knoblovitz, Nachman Kirschenbaum, Yedidia Fogel, Dov Steinmetz, Moshe Levi, Moshe Ben Shalom, Yosef David El Haddad, Yaakov El Hanan Sarkovsky, Nachman Daniel Morris, Shmuel Tzvi, Reb Shmuel Tzvi Kalsberg, Moshe Nathan Note uh, Engard, and his brother Yeshua Engard, David Echad Sharf. Yosef Yehuda Levi, Ishai Meulam, Avram Daniel Anbom, Eliezer Yitzchak Koltai, Rabbi Ariel Tzadik, Rabbi Yosef Greenbaum, Yedidia Chiwis, Yossi Cohen, Elkana Shila. Baruch Dayan Haimet, Kadosh Baruch Hu will uplift their neshamot even higher than the extraordinary level that they're all in. Um, we uh, are seeing that the uh, tragedy in Meron is uh, waking up some people, confusing others, and um, we need to clarify some things. Also, uh, for the issue will be for a refuah uh, shlema, for uh, Orit Bat Ilana, uh, Itro Ben Avram, Stefan Ben Katarina, Talia Bat Sara, um, and also Atzlacha Raba for Marsha Bat Juli, Ayla Bat Marsha, uh, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sefas Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, and Shaul Ben Farzane, Oshri Ben Doris, Gabi Ben Doris, Elad Ben Doris, and David Ben Esriya. Kadosh Baruch Hu, Yivarech Et Kulam, uh, and also Refua Shlema, uh, to uh, Rabbanit uh, Sara Bat Anat, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, and Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara. Kadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Otam Bekol Mikol Kol, Chaim Arukim Shlemim, Eleim Torah, Mitzvot, Gmiut Chasadim. If I forgot any names, I'm sorry. Uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu knows what I'm trying to do. Um, we, uh, and of course, anyone that's watching it, sharing this you will surely uh, benefit from the uh, merits that will come out of the Torah that we'll learn today. So, uh, of course, the, uh, the tragedy is uh, something that I'm assuming all of you have heard about, uh, many people are crying about. Um, I spoke to uh, one uh, one gadol that uh, tells me he hasn't stopped crying to the point where there's blood coming out. 
Um, I mean, this has hit some people very, very hard. As it says, en bai chen bomet. There's a uh, no house that there isn't a, a dead body where everybody knows somebody, if not directly or indirectly, that uh, passed. It's, our nation is very small, but we're a family and everyone is connected in some way or another. Uh, and uh, some people took it very hard and some people moved on as quickly as uh, you move on when you uh, see the obituary section in the newspaper where you'll see sometimes, uh, you know, the um, news of the disaster that happened last week to our small nation of 45 people dead and uh, countless people uh, injured in a very difficult shape. And right under it, you'll see a, uh, you know, a advertisement for ice cream or something, and people will just go on to the ice cream with not really much care in the world. And that's just a reality. And if that's not bad enough, you also have the uh, flood floodgates open of all the uh, haters of Israel, the anti-Semitics, where one uh, reporter announced that uh, uh, more than 33% of all of the messages coming out on Twitter and other social media were uh, celebration that the, the Jewish people died, uh, celebration that this tragedy happened, and uh, oh, you know, as much as we would like to say, yeah, it's all coming from uh, Arab terrorists or uh, anti-Semitic uh, people from different countries. And yes, you'd be right as in saying that a lot of it is coming from them, but unfortunately, not all of it. There are, unfortunately, some people that are alachically Jewish, they were born to a Jewish mother, uh, that are uh, actually uh, happy that the religious people died because they hate them so much, because they admire leaders like uh, uh, the guy Avigdo from, uh, from Israel that's trying to become uh, the Prime Minister, Chas Shalom, or all of the other haters of the Torah to such an extent that they're happy that uh, religious people have died. This is a reality, Rabutai. We're not necessarily going to spend any time talking about these idiots uh, because they're already speaking for themselves and showing their filth themselves there's no reason for us to waste our time with them uh, really the goal tonight is to get a clarity uh, as it is our way in a uh, bakodesh is to get clarity of what is happening who is uh, you know who is to blame uh, is there someone to blame are we going to be sitting there dumbfounded like many others that are saying oh Nistarot ke Hashem, Hashem's ways are mysterious, we don't know why this happened. Uh, and unfortunately, some really big rabbis have made the statement of saying that we don't know why this happened. And uh, it's uh, sad to say, but this is the wrong uh, approach. Uh, because our Torah Kedushat tells us exactly what happened and why it happened and so on. Now to get the uh, one thing out of the way, is that there is a, uh, of course, the Yetzirah, when he makes posts on social media, all of his posts go viral. When a real Shi'ul Torah or something holy uh, is posted somewhere, you know, it's like snail mail. Maybe it'll arrive, maybe it won't arrive, you know, but with Yetzirah, when he sends something, it arrives everywhere. And there's at least a handful of people have sent me this particular text message uh, as you know, saying, "Oh, look! This is already written in the Torah that 45 people are going to die during the Lula of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. It's written in the Zohar, and so on." Okay, this is what the post looks like. I'm sure you've seen. It's like a page uh, with Hebrew writing on it. Some things underlined on there. 99% of the people that are sending it to you do not know how to read Hebrew. And even if they know how to read Hebrew, they don't really know Aramaic, so they have no idea what's being said. But somebody told them that this means that, uh, you know, it was already predicted in the Zohar that 45 people are going to die on the Lula of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. This is a lie. It's not written in the Zohar. It's, in fact, not written at all. The whole story here is, in essence, actually talking about one tzaddik that was a, uh, uh, in serious trouble, and to save him, to save him, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, in essence, what they did is they killed 45 Reshaim. They f killed 45 Reshaim uh, in order, to, 45 wicked people uh, in order to save him. 
It's not 45 people dying or anything like that, uh, that are tzaddikim or anything like that, or a tragedy, uh, but rather this is a uh, uh, saying to, to, to celebrate the Lula of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai because in his honor, uh, with the Jew was protected, the Jewish people were protected. It has nothing to do with a tragedy happen of 45 tzaddikim, Kedoshe Elyon, like the ones that uh, just passed, uh, dying. Uh, but of course, people that uh, want to get some attention and know that they can take advantage of the ignorance of the public will send whatever they want to send. Well, with some type of an, you know goal. Oh yeah, maybe if they see that this is already written, maybe I don't know. Maybe they're gonna like the Zohar now. Maybe they're gonna donate more money. Maybe they're going to do tshuva. This is not the way of Torah. This is not the way of Torah Rabotai Karim. The Torah Kedusha tells us, Midval Sheker Tichak. From a thing of lies, stay away from. Stay away from. Don't make up anything. We don't need to make up anything in order to get people to do tshuva. We don't need to lie in order to uh, motivate people to get closer to the Torah. We have the Torah. It's full of emet. You want it. It's available to you on a silver platter. You don't want it. You don't want it. That's your, you, you live your life full of troubles. That's just your reality. But... Unfortunately, some people don't have enough emunah in our Torah itself, and they feel like they need to manipulate the Torah in order to convince people to come on board. You know, it's the salesmanship, where you know it's like people telling you, "Listen, if you keep Shabbat, Hashem is going to give you a lot of money, and if you uh, donate money, Hashem is going to give you a lot of money." And everything is always like, you know, Hashem is going to give you, give you, give you, and they think that this is going to sell the Torah. We don't sell the Torah, Rabbi. The Torah does not need selling. Torah is the best product in the world that sells itself, but for only those people that are looking for the truth, not for people that are looking for rewards uh, that are coming to them in a few weeks or a few days. And unfortunately, today, it's very common that people will promise you all types of things just for the sake of you doing something, but what they're promising you is just something that they made up themselves. Are there blessings in the Torah for keeping it? Absolutely. Are there promises that it's going to happen to you specifically right now? Absolutely not. No such thing. No such thing. Anyone that tells you you keep Shabbat, you're guaranteed to be this, this, and that, Torah doesn't say it. Does the Torah guarantee certain things? Yes, it does. But not the way people are pitching it, especially when people are making up stuff. So art way in the Torah is Torah is emit. It's 100% true because the Kadosh Baruch Hu's signature is emit. When there is something that is emet, that is full of truth, we publicize it with all of our power. When it's a lie, we will also publicize it. Why? Because everyone needs to know how to tell the difference between truth and false. And don't just fall into anything that sounds good or has some famous rabbi's picture on it. Just because the, the rabbi's picture is on it doesn't necessarily mean that he even knows about it. Like it is, unfortunately, many times with a lot of these campaigns where they raise a lot of money, 30 seconds after the tragedy, they already have 87 campaigns raising money for the sake of the people that died. I would be, uh, you know, I would be surprised if a single dollar is going to go to those families in many of those campaigns. And the reason why is because, unfortunately, the, uh, the, uh, the money world is very dirty and uh, it has infected uh, the, the uh, you know, all aspects of life, both the religious Jews and other religions. And I even have one of the Gdolim, one of the Gdolei Ador in Yerushalayim today even say himself, told my Rav who told me that when it comes to the, uh, the uh, Tzedakah, the, the, the major Kupot, the major uh, foundations and so on and so forth that are raising for specific causes, if you really care about the cause, go to the people themselves and give it to them. Don't give it to some general box that's going to give it to the people because many times, unfortunately, it never gets there. And we even have testimony of people that are victims of this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is one of, the, uh, one of the underlying issues that we're dealing with that has to do with the story where you have a, uh, a woman gets a phone call from somebody trying to raise money for the sake of somebody that died. And she says, well, actually, the one that you're raising money for, you said for the last few months, actually is my husband. He died. I'm the widow. Oh, and the person, oh, hold on a second. Talk to my wife. He's, she says, well, 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 you're raising money for my husband, but you never told me that you're raising money for my husband. Am I gonna, you didn't send me any money. You said you've been raising money for a few months. She says, listen, lady, we're raising money. But we have other uh, payments to pay. We have cars. We have houses. We have to pay for. Eventually, you're gonna get your money. 
A lot of times, Rabotai Karim, you send money to these, uh, you know, big boxes of, of, of tzedakah, and it doesn't necessarily go there. And that's unfortunately because we have a, a world, a world full of lies, a world full of lies, and sometimes the lie has a kippah and a, and a beard, sometimes a mitpachat, and sometimes it looks like a gangster. It's not necessarily always the same, and it's very, very important to stick to the truth under all costs, under all costs, even if it's uncomfortable. It's very important. Why? Because our Torah is emit. Our Torah is emit, and as Rav Kanievsky writes in his book, the most difficult character trait to, to, uh, to hold up and to fight for is the Midata emit, the trait of emit, being always honest, no matter what. And that's one of the things we have to work on all the time, Rabotai. This is one of the reasons why we're going to give this to you. We're going to talk about some things that perhaps are hard to hear because it doesn't have necessarily much to do with anybody other than the people that are watching this shoe right now or will watch this shoe in the future. Uh, it's, a, it's not going to pin the, the blame on any government member. It's not going to pin the blame on any particular policies in a different country or, the, or it's not going to pin the blame at any particular uh, uh, rabbi or such. It's actually going to pin the blame on us. Us meaning myself, us meaning my Rav, us meaning the people that are following our teaching and watching it, us meaning the people that are watching right now or in the future, you. Why? Because kol Israel aravim zelaze. We are all responsible for each other and we have to understand what is happening in our world in order to eliminate all of the doubts being told to people of saying we don't know why what happened happened. We are going to look deeply into our Torah and see why what happened, happened. It's time everybody understood it once and for all, because if you understand this answer, you'll understand why the Holocaust happened. You'll understand why Corona happened. You'll understand why any tragedy that happened in the past or Chas Shalom, if anything will happen in the future, why it's happening. Rabotai, it's extremely important that you pay attention to this you and not comment back and forth, go make yourself popcorn or do anything of such because if you miss a point, you could simply miss the entire you. And if you're not going to uh, pay attention, you're just wasting your time. It's critical that a person that's watching this, that's listening to this, pay attention to every detail because it has to do with you. And, uh, and it has to do with everyone in our nation that it really is looking for the truth. And the truth sometimes hurts. The truth sometimes hurts, and many times it does, but nonetheless, we need to have it. This is Torah, and we need to learn it. The Torah Kedusha tells us, Rabotai Karim, that in a, uh, in, 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 across the board, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not looking to punish us. But unfortunately, as we learned just last week, from the Chinuch, and also from uh, many of the other Chachamim, Rav Wasserman, and many of the Chachamim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not looking to punish Am Israel. But at the same token, there is a Mishnah in Avot that says that say, uh, uh, when a person makes a mitzvah, they create for themselves an angel that's going to protect them, that's going to help them make more mitzvot. But when a person makes sins, then he creates a kategor, a prosecutor. Uh, a demon type of angel that's unfortunately going to make it more difficult for him to make more mitzvot. It's going to make it more difficult for him to get closer to Hashem and in fact going to entice him to make more sins. So a person that makes a sin makes a, uh, opens up the door to make even more sins. A person that makes mitzvot opens up the door to more mitzvot. Simple, very simple. It's like a, uh, anything else in life. The, uh, you see that your uh, one thing leads to another. Now we whether it's rabbis or leaders or otherwise have a responsibility to tell the people the truth regardless of what tears are going to flow and we even have a lacha that tells us as such the rambam writes in ilchot taniyot in chapter one alacha number one is it is a positive scriptural commandment a torah commandment to cry out and to sound the trumpets in the event of any difficulty that arises which affects the community. And it says in the book of Numbers, chapter 10, verse 9, when you go out to war against an enemy who attacks you and you sound out the trumpets. 
Here the Rambam is telling us first and foremost that when there is a communal issue, such as the one that's happening as we speak, whether it is the coronavirus that began over a year ago, or it's the current tragedy where 45 tzaddikim died in the process of doing a mitzvah, in the process of honoring a tzaddik, in the process of praying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And we're not talking about 45 gangsters. We're not talking about 45 criminals. We're not talking about 45 people that desecrated Shabbat. We're talking about people that have stories that if you listen to their stories, they simply make you cry. To, to, before we go into the halacha, just to understand who we're dealing with, if you, haven't, if you haven't read some of these things. One of the people that survived, survived this tragedy when the, uh, the whole seating area collapsed and piles and piles of people went on top of each other, causing untold damage. One of the people that survived said that he heard throughout the whole time where he didn't even know if he was going to survive. He didn't know if he was going to be able to continue breathing. But the one thing that he kept hearing and anyone that was there heard was that there was someone below all of them that was talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and saying, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please, I forgive every single person that's stepping on top of me right now that's causing me not to be able to breathe, that's causing me to most likely die. I forgive every single one of them, even if it means that I'm going to die. This is the type of tzaddik that died during this issue, during this tragedy. Someone that while he's dying, he's praying for the people that are killing him. This is the type of tzaddik that died. In another situation, you have... A Rav that took his son and also his Talmud that was to him like a son. Where they both died. And at his Levaya, at his funeral, he says, I was 20 seconds away from dying myself. They ran out of air. There was no oxygen. There was no nothing to breathe. And he says that with literally seconds left for my life, they saved me. You, you merited to be selected to go to the best yeshiva in the world, in this world. But a Kadosh Baruch Hu decided that even that is not good enough for you. He wants to take you to the best yeshiva in the universe, the yeshiva of heaven, to go study with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. You merited to go to that yeshiva now. I did not merit, he says. I did not have your merits. I did not have your significance. You were selected to go to the yeshiva of heaven. I was not. This is the type of tzaddikim that died, Rabotai. This is the type of tzaddikim that died. In one of the other stories, you have two kids, and two kids, and one died. And the one that survived, nine years old, talked to a journalist. She asked him, what did you feel? How did you go? What did you do? She said, all I can do is I can say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, over and over again. And he kept asking this nine-year-old boy, what did you feel? What did you feel? He said, Shema Yisrael, you can't breathe, you're, 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 you're being crushed. What do you feel? He said, I felt emuna. I felt Hashem. That's what I felt. To a secular journalist, this doesn't mean anything. Until you hear it from a nine-year-old. Until you hear it from someone who stared death, death in the face. This is the type of tzaddikim, Rabotai. We're not talking about people that are just regular people. We're talking about the best of them. The best of the Litvish world, the best of the Hasidish world, the best of the Sephardic world, the best of all parts of Am Yisrael, the best of the best. This is... The tragedy that happened. This is the tragedy that happened, Rabotai Karim. The responsa, Divre Malkiel, writes that any woman that dies while giving birth is considered as if she died on Kiddush Hashem. 
Why? Because as the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 118b, says that a person, person, the uh, Rabbi Yossi says, a person that dies, a person that is in a uh, process of a uh, uh, doing a mitzvah, person that's in the process of doing a mitzvah, is in the process of doing Kiddush Hashem. And since this woman, since this woman was a, uh, in the process of doing a mitzvah, says, may my portion, Rabbi Yossi says, may my portion be among those who die while they're on the way to perform a mitzvah. A woman that is delivering a baby is in the process of, do, of doing a mitzvah. Needless to say, all of the people that died in Miron we're in the process of praying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for salvation for Am Yisrael, salvation for themselves, for their family, to get higher in Torah. You hear some of these stories of these young kids, these rabbis, these tzaddikim, who were celebrating just completing the Shas, completing a Masechet, or uh, one young boy that died. His father cries over him. He says, this kid didn't want to stop studying. I used to rebuke him to take it easy a little bit, but... And to force him to go to sleep because he wouldn't stop listening to Shurim at 3 o'clock in the morning. I told him to stop. And then I would find in the morning after he leave, I find notes inside his pillow because he couldn't stop. He kept learning, learning, learning more Torah. This is the type of tzaddik that HaKadosh Baruch took from us. This is the type of tzaddik that HaKadosh Baruch took, Rabbi And these people all died in Kiddush Hashem. Why? Because they were all in the process of doing a mitzvah. Praying for their families, praying for themselves, praying for the Torah, praying for Akadosh Baruch Hu's people. That's what they were praying for. Unfortunately, Rabotai, that's why the Kitrug is not on them. It's on us. The case is against us. The case is against us, Rabotai. Because the Rambam writes that it's a positive. Torah commandment to cry out and sound out the trumpets in the event of any difficulty that arises which affects the community. Just like when we would cry out and sound the horn when we'd go to war. Here the Rambam is mentioning that sounding of the trumpets and the uh, sacrifices are done during distress and also during sacrifices. And it's important to know that this particular mitzvah is observed all throughout Eretz Yisrael and is not dependent on having the Bet HaMikdash. And that's why the Magen Avram in uh, section 576 uh, in uh, uh, al number 1 asks a question. Why is in the sounding of the trumpets not observed today, even during his time, needless today, where you have countless tragedies happening to Am Yisrael, and no one is crying out, no one is sounding the trumpet. People just move on. You see it in the news, 500,000 posts on the internet, almost as many organizations raising money, almost as many people mentioning it here and there, but no trumpets, no crying out. For the most part, a little while later, people move on. Question is, what's the point of sounding the trumpet and crying out? And that's what the Rambam will elaborate in the following halacha. Where he says that the commandment is not restricted in any type of uh, limited scope, but rather the intent is whenever you are distressed by difficulties, whether it be famine, plague, locust, any type of uh, tragedy that is affecting the community, not individuals, but rather the community, Cry out to a Kadosh Baruch Hu because of them and, tr- and sound the trumpets. Why? Alcha number two explains it. Number two, the Rambam elaborates. Why do we need 
to sound the trumpet why do we need to cry oy vey? why do we need to cry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? but not just the individuals we're talking about the leaders the biggest rabbis in the world the rabbis in every community all over the world needs to be crying out sounding the trumpets right now should have already been sounding the trumpets for over a year with the plague that we've had in the world but barely any trumpets are being sounded the only thing that we heard is people complaining about Jews that are not wearing their masks that's all we heard about then we heard about about Jews that don't want to take the vaccine but sounding the trumpet telling people this is what the Allah is no one has why because there's a reason for this there's a reason for this Rabotai Karim there's a reason why you have to sound the trumpets and that reason is the reason why people don't want to do it the Rambam says the practice of sounding the trumpet and crying out is one of the paths of repentance of doing tshuva for when a difficulty arises and the people cry out to Hashem and sound the trumpets everyone will realize that this difficulty whether it be corona or the tragedy in Meron or the different tragedies that are in different communities around the world throughout the ages these difficulties occurred because of their evil conduct as Jeremiah said in chapter 5 verse 25 your sins have turned away the rains and the harvest climate this realization the Rambam says will cause the removal of the difficulty here the Rambam gives us an atomic bomb that most modern type rabbis do not want to talk about instead of telling us the reason why corona happened the reason why the holocaust happened the reason why Miron tragedy happened the reason why all tragedies are happening to Ami said throughout all of history is for the same reason they've always happened it's because of our sins the sound of the trumpet is to wake up the sleepy people to wake up the people that are so busy making money chasing money chasing girls chasing boys chasing everything but tshuva the sound of the trumpet is to tell people it is now almost too late because there are bodies on the floor if we don't do tshuva it will get worse yeah but 45 people already died yes that's just the down payment this Rabotai is what the Rambam is saying the tragedy that's happening already for a year thousands of people have died from viruses whether it's corona or it's something else there were literally times where they were collecting body bags and didn't have places to bury them in New York in, in, in Israel in different places so many people died in the last year not a single trumpet almost no one wants to talk about the real reason of why everything is happening the Rambam is saying without knowing about what we're doing today he wrote this 800 plus years ago he says there's a reason always and the reason is always the same tragedy is a result of sins that's why tragedy happens whether it's tzaddikim 45 tzaddikim dying in one day or it is countless others over the last year or it's six million in the Holocaust or whatever other the tragedy the reason is always the same that's the psak alakha so anyone that says yeah but my Rebbe told me that we don't know why the Holocaust happened we don't know why such and such happened well show your Rebbe Rambam your Rebbe surely is not bigger than the Rambam your Rebbe surely cannot say no the Rambam is not doesn't know what he's talking about because if he does he's a kofer your Rebbe and he's no longer a Rebbe there is no such thing as we don't know that's the Allah it's not a mashal it's not a parable it's not an analogy it's not maybe psak Allah this is the Allah we have a tragedy as a community it's because of sins that's why it happens but not just little sins big sins accumulated over a long period of time Rabotai. 
and the worst of all of those sins Rabotai, the worst of all of those sins is when the tragedy happens and we do not understand what we need to do because no one is telling us because that is what the Rambam talks about next he says here Rabotai in Ilchot Truma where the Rambam writes that although all of the mitzvot of the Torah are divine decrees and thus they're unfathomable to us to understand the real details of them we have an obligation to exert ourselves to the fullest extent to understand them to the best of our ability and therefore in Ilchot Shuvah chapter 3 Alachanam before the Rambam writes that although the sounding of the Shofar on Rosh Hashanah is a mitzvah it also contains the illusion that the Shofar is saying wake up sleepy ones you who forget the truth in the vanities of time look to your souls and improve your conduct in so many words the point of the Shofar in Rosh Hashanah and any other time is to wake people up to start doing tshuva and stop desecrating Shabbat stop wasting seed stop stealing from each other stop being angry for every little thing stop desecrating Hashem's name and on and on and on each and every single one of us has to stop lying stop cheating stop going against the Torah itself that's the point of the Shofar that's what we're supposed to learn during Rosh Hashanah that's what we're supposed to learn during the last year of the coronavirus day in day out that's what we're supposed to learn over the last couple of days instead of doing anything else to try to pacify our conscience in order to make us feel good and stop being depressed that some people died we should realize this is our fault if you are alive and you suffered from this you have to know you are partly at fault the extent of how much you got hurt is how much needs to be fixed even more so for the rest of us that are barely doing anything to help Klal Israel get closer to Hashem and stop sinning now the worst part of it all Rabotai the worst part of it all is that the failure to observe mitzvot brings misfortune the Rambam says and in turn it makes it harder to observe the mitzvot but when the Jews turn to Hashem and do tshuva he'll remove the hardship what if they don't Allah number three same section Aval, im lo yizaku, velo yariu, ela yomru davar ze mi minaga olam. Conversely, should the people fail to cry out to Hashem and sound out the trumpets and instead say, what has happened to us is merely a natural phenomenon, and this difficulty whether it be Miron or coronavirus or the Inquisition or the Holocaust or anything else this difficulty is merely a chance occurrence it's because of some bad people it's because of bad construction it's because of bad policies in the government it's because of uh, such and such person no to say it specifically people and specifically things in essence blaming it on one particular thing and not blaming it on ourselves needing to do tshuva this the Rambam says is a cruel conception of things this is a cruel to say such things that this just happened because of bad construction or bad policies or that there was a lot of people for anyone who knows first of all there was less than people less people this year than many other years most years there's anywhere between 250 to 500,000 people that go this year was only a hundred thousand and this is the year that it happened surely Akadosh Baruch Hu is giving us clarification it's not because of the amount of people and it's not because of the type of people because it wasn't just Hasidim it wasn't just Faradim it wasn't just the Skinazim it wasn't just just anything in fact it was the best of them 
It was the best of everyone. Good people. Tzadikim. Yeresh Shamayim. That's the ones that he took. To say it's anything else other than Klal Israel not listening to the messages from Hashem to do tshuva is cruel, the Rambam says. Which, why is it cruel? Because it causes them to remain attached to their wicked deeds. Thus, this time of distress will lead to further distresses. Why does the Rambam say that it leads them to attach to their wicked deeds? Usually, wicked people don't attach to their deeds. Usually, they make one sin, they move to another. They don't necessarily just get attached to one particular sin. As it says, that Reshaim, uh, all of their uh, days are full of regrets. They made that sin, they regret it, but they end up making a diff- different type of sin. So they don't usually attach to one particular sin. They make different sins. But he says here, by you not telling them they have to do tshuva, they don't even think that they're sinning. They don't even think that they're sinning. Arav Yagen Alava Shalom was asked one time, how come most of the lectures that you give are in communities where people are secular and people are not exactly uh, so strong or, you know, why don't you give more of your lectures to the Haredi crowd, to the people that are extremely religious? He says, because when I go to the communities that are weak, there are people there that are looking for the truth and I find them and I help them do tshuva. But in many times you go to the religious community, people say, well, what do I need this for? We're religious already. I had one time somebody tell me, I told him, listen, we have some new CDs, some new USB, some new things. I want to send it to your community to give out. Oh no, what is this, Kiruv stuff? No, no, we're, we're in a religious community. We don't need the Kiruv stuff. We don't need to do tshuva. We're all religious. This is what Rabbi again used to say. People think that since they already keep Shabbat, they already wear a hat, they already have a mitpachat or whatever, yeah, they don't need to do tshuva. Little do they know that every single one of us needs to do tshuva regardless of how religious you already are. And unfortunately, when people do not tell you the truth, that you need to do tshuva, that you need to change, that you need to improve, that we need to improve, the Rambam says that makes them cruel. Why? Because a person could literally attach to their sins because they don't even think that they're so sinful. They don't even think there's anything wrong with it. He thinks, listen, I curse. What's the big deal? Okay, so... There's like a uh, derasha, Merusha, uh, Shmuli Botech says that, listen, I, he has a brother that's homosexual, and he says, listen, there's 613 commandments in the Torah. Okay, so you're violating one, you have 612 other ones to work on. As if homosexuality is not a big deal. Reality is, Rabotai, people like that are what's destroying Am Yisrael. People like that are what's destroying Am Yisrael. These are the bad shepherds that are destroying Am Yisrael, but nonetheless, it is our responsibility, not theirs. They're already wicked. They're going to stay attached to their wickedness. It's our responsibility to shed light to the world. Each one of us. As long as we have not done full tshuva, as long as we are still holding back, damage, damage is spreading everywhere because we are responsible. The ones that know the truth, the ones that want to live the truth, the ones that have the ability to share the truth, we are responsible for it. Not the wicked ones. Not the people that like to spread falsehood. Surely one of our responsibilities is to shed darkness on them and to make sure that nobody listens to them and nobody follows them. But of course, just like I said before, the Yetzirah, when he sends a text message, it goes viral. But that's why it's our responsibility to do even more than what we're doing because to just say listen this happened i wasn't there and therefore uh, you know it doesn't really affect me wrong if you're alive you're watching you understand it happened for sure you have a hand in it and the rambam continues saying that this implies this is implied in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, verse 27 and 28, where it's one of the scariest sections of the Torah, where HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Ve'alachtem imi bekeri, ve'alachtem gam ani imachem bechamat keri. Where HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to us that if you remain indifferent to me, meaning that everything you treat as if it's a chance occurrence, the virus, 
the pogrom, the inquisition, the holocaust, the destruction. It's all chance. It happens. You know, it happens every so often. And you remain indifferent to me, meaning the actions that I, the things that I bring to the world, the tragedies that I bring to the world, you're just saying, nah, it's just, you know, the volcano erupts once in a while. What's the big deal? Why, it has to be because of sins, Rabbi? Why do you have to be so fanatic? The Rambam says such behavior is cruel. Why? Because it says in the Torah that if you remain indifferent to me, I will remain indifferent to you with a vengeance, Hashem says. Meaning that he will bring even more severe punishment. They will bring even more difficulties upon the people so that you shall repent. And you say that it is a chance recurrence and say that it's not a chance occurrence. And until you stop saying it's a chance recurrence, until you understand it's from Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will increase the punishment. Hashem Yishmo. So the question is, why is it considered evil? Aside from what we already said. Because the Mepharshim say that once a person understands that the tragedies that are happening in the world are because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to get us not everyone else us us individuals us communities us the synagogue us wherever us is is us don't just look at your neighbor and say oh listen he's still not keeping shabbat okay great get him to keep shabbat but also get yourself to do something too a lot of time people focus on everybody else oh rabbi can i uh share such and such information with that why are you even asking go share but what about you are you doing tshuva too no i already keep shabbos great that you keep shabbos but what are you working on are you working on something are you doing something what i thought that as long as i donate a little bit of money and i uh, keep shabbat and i keep kosher that's it i'm done you're never done as long as you're alive because those who wants more for you wants more to love from you wants more mitzvot from you more chesed from you more 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 that's adam la'amal yulad a person came to the world to work to toil how much more how much is more more than what you're doing now and what after i do more than what i'm doing now add more and how much more more than the more simple more than what you're doing every day more and more that's why it's ridiculous when people tell me listen somebody told me that if i do too much when i first start doing tshuva maybe i'll break how can you do too much if you don't know anything first of all second of all there's certain things that is not considered too much it's very basic keeping shabbat is not too much it's very basic without keeping shabbat you're still not part of klal israel so whoever told you don't do too much i don't know what they're referring to but because for a beginner you don't even know anything yet to do too much but that's the reality most people they think that at some point you do a little bit and you can park there is no parking you park when you die and even then just the body's parking for a little while the neshama continues as we have talked about many many times the point is abutai is that when a person understands that all of what's happening in the world is messages from a kadosh Hu, the tragedies the difficulties the, the all of the issues that are happening in the world is from hashem no one else the satan does not have any outside power from hashem everything the satan does has a signature <laughs> permission from akadosh Hu. when the mashkit goes when the satan comes he kills somebody he doesn't kill him by himself he has permission from hashem anyone that thinks it's a satan somehow is uh has power outside of hashem it's idol worship akadosh Hu is the one signing off on everything on everything about so when a person understands that a tragedy happened that is a message from hashem this is supposed to motivate the person to change his conduct to do tshuva and appreciate the message the tragedy as a merciful statement a merciful message from abu Ghaid barakh why you see that tragedy that happened in india you see that tragedy that happened in syria to see that tragedy that happened so and so you could have been part of it it didn't happen to you that means that kadosh Baruch Hu is saying to you it's getting close but don't let it get too close i'm asking you to do tshuva nicely 
I'm asking you to do tshuva nicely. But when a person refuses to pay attention to the external cues from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to up the ante and increase, increase the motivation. And that's why Rabotai, the Rambam says that when a person does not pay attention to these messages, he's simply going to guarantee that he is going to have even more difficulties in his life. And even more so, the people that are the leaders of the communities, the leaders of the communities, they can tell you what we already mentioned in the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, that all of the people that passed are tzaddikim, and they're right. All of them died on Kiddush Hashem, and they're right. Gemara Masechet Shabbat. Amar Rabbi Yossi, Yechel ki mimete bederech mitzvah, that may my portion be among those who die in the process of performing a mitzvah. That's fantastic. But that's not going to help you. To know that they died on Kiddush Hashem is not going to help you. It also is not going to stop the next tragedy from happening. Why? Because it's not motivating anyone to do any mitzvot. Maybe you'll donate some money. Okay, great. But are you going to change your actions? Are you going to do anything else other than that? Unfortunately, many people... They just think, okay, it's Kiddush Hashem, they're in a higher level, I feel bad for them. 24 hours, 48 hours, maximum 72 hours, they're back to their life eating ice cream on the way to work. That's it, finish. That's why the Rambam says that such attitude is cruel. And this actually is what brought the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. Same Gemara, Masechet Shabbat, the next page, 119b. Amar Yerushalayim was destroyed only because people of truth disappeared from it. As it is written, Here, Rabotai, the Gemara says, when people of truth disappeared, what people of truth? People that tell the truth. What's the reason a tragedy is coming? What's the reason? Same thing in Masechet Chagiga also says the same thing, page 14. Furthermore, the Rambam Paskins in Chot Avelut, chapter 13, Alachan number 12. Whoever does not mourn over his dead in the manner in which the sages commanded is a cruel person. Someone had somebody die in their family. They don't want to mourn. Why? They got a party to go to. They have a vacation to go to. They have a dinner to go to. They don't feel like being depressed. Their psychiatrist recommended they don't do it. Ramam says, you have a stamp. In Shemaim, your name, right, in your picture, right next to it, the word cruel. Achzari. Why achzari? Why, why cruel? For the same reason we talked about before. Instead, one should be fearful, worry, examine his deeds, and do tshuva. As it says in the uh, Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 12, and the living shall take it to heart. Anytime you see somebody died, especially if it's somebody close to you, somebody's in your community, somebody's in your school, somebody's in your synagogue, needless to say, somebody in your family died, it's supposed to scare you to death. It's supposed to worry you to death. Why should it worry you to death? Because the Rambam elaborates here. If one member of a group dies, the entire group should worry for God's judgment is extended against all of them. For the first three days, the Rambam says, one should see himself as if a sword is drawn over his neck, meaning the Satan is right over his neck and like 
any wrong move you do tak. that's what happens when a person dies in within your circle he doesn't say your family your circle your synagogue your community your neighborhood the satan is on everybody everyone that's in there uh, satan is on everybody that's why everybody has to mourn we're not mourning to just help this person we're mourning to do tshuva ourselves that's in essence the point that's why it's in the chot avilut for the first three days you should act as if the sword is drawn on his neck from the third day till the seventh day you should consider it as if the sword is in the corner meaning it's not on top of you but it's, he's still in the same room and from that time onwards meaning for that whole year it's as if it's passing before him in the market all of this why is all of this danger all of this is so that the person should prepare himself and do tshuva repent and wake up from his sleep as it is written by jeremiah chapter 5 verse number 3 you have stricken them he tells hashem but they have not trembled this implies the rambam says that one should be awake and tremble when a kadosh Baruch who's bringing tragedy to his life why is he why is he asleep what is he asleep from so the mefashim says he's sleeping because he's over occupied he's preoccupied with chasing material things and his chase for money his following bitcoin and the stock market and the real estate market and the coronavirus and all of the other things is simply making him completely desensitized to the fact that there's bodies everywhere it's like the people that are overly concerned about whether the vaccine is legit or it's poison they you know they, they send you a bunch of reports a bunch of emails oh look there there bill gates is behind it oh look there is a um the the mob is behind it the government is behind it it's gonna work it's not gonna work like do you realize people are dying like do you have any concept that there's actual real people with families and so on that are dying and you're just talking about it as if it's like i don't know a baseball game so preoccupied with chasing the stock market is like listen 45 tzaddikim died last week wow you think the market's gonna go down because of it what the market's gonna go that's what you're worried about 45 tzaddikim died and you're worried about how the stock market's gonna open up on monday morning if it's gonna affect the market so you can make or, or lose money like that's where you're at that's why the rambam says akadosh Baruch Hu knows his creation and therefore he tells us clearly someone died in your vicinity it's a warning to everybody it's a warning to everybody to the point that literally everyone needs to be scared for their life hence the reason when the leaders when the rabbis when the gdole ado are not sounding the horns your local rabbi in your community instead of telling you rabotai it's time we do tshuva not let's you know pray and 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 and, you know their neshama will be elevated no let's pray for us to be elevated let's us do something why we are all being warned we are all being warned by a kadosh baruchu the knife is in the hand of the mashrit and he is in the room first three days he's on top of us after that he's still in the same vicinity he's in the synagogue he's in the community he's a shemi shmo that's what it is each one of us has to take the warning personally why it's a reality that's the halacha that's the halacha rabotai and anyone that simply treats it as if oh this is fanatic this is this this is that you want to treat it that way you want to take your life that way by all means go ahead I know somebody personally a very very dear person to me a family member that saw this alakha in real life when her mother died she went to her house where her father was still living and uh it's morning the mother just died uh, day before everyone's crying 
Okay, at some point, you have to go to sleep. You're going to bury the, uh, the, the, the woman the next, uh, the following day, or they buried her that day. I'm not sure how the logistics of it worked at that time. But nonetheless, they, uh, she's, you know, she missed her mom. She was crying. So, okay, I'm going to go to sleep. And she's decided to go sleep in her mom's room. She went to sleep in her mom's room. And the second that she entered the room, didn't feel so weird. But she's like, oh, it's because, you know, someone died. It's weird. It's... She said, suddenly, not while she's sleeping. This wasn't a dream. Suddenly, she starts feeling that someone else is in the room. Hashem Yishmor Rabotai. I heard this firsthand. This is not a story I heard from a story or a story that I read. Heard this firsthand from the person, family member. We'll leave it at that. Someone is in the room with her. She looks around. No one's there. Lays back down. And then that someone is choking her to death. Choking her, choking her, choking her to death. Rabotai. She didn't know what to do. Obviously, this thing has powers that's beyond what uh, a human being. She doesn't know what to do. And at a moment of mercy from heaven... She got blurted out the words, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And at that second, it let go and she ran out of the room. Why? As the Rambam Paskin Lalacha. He wasn't theorizing, Rabotai. He wasn't saying, oh, this is a good suggestion. When there's a death, everyone has to understand. The Mashchit is there. First three days especially. Never sleep in the dead person's uh, uh, bed during that time. But nonetheless, Abutai, these are not suggestions. These are alachas. These are what we live by. And those who choose to ignore it, make fun of it, or simply think, act as if they don't exist, at your own peril. Now, the question is, why does HaKadosh Baruch Hu take tzaddikim? Why don't he just take reshaim? Why didn't he just kill a bunch of wicked people? Why did he have to take 45 tzaddikim? People that are literally forgiving the people that are killing them while they're killing them. People that have chidushe Torah inside their pockets that they're writing. People that have one young boy, one little kid, I don't know, maybe a teenager. He had this little book that he would write all types of things and he would read it constantly. No one knew what was in it. After he died, they opened the book. And the kid, the boy, says in the book, he read every day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I know you can take my neshama at any given moment. And I thank you for giving me another day. Because I know that at any given moment you can take it even if I go to the grave of Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai. Like, he actually wrote it! And that's what happened. This kid read this and valued every minute of his life. Because he's able to learn Torah. He's able to do mitzvot. That's the precious neshama that HaKadosh Baruch Hu uprooted from the world, put in his yeshiva of Shamayim. That boy is in Gan Eden. There's no worries about him. The worries on us being here. Why is HaKadosh Baruch Hu taking the tzaddikim? Why don't he just take a bunch of Hezbollah members? Why don't he take a bunch of anti-Torah people, liberal, lefty, Zionist, why don't he just take a bunch of people that hate Am Yisrael? Why don't he take them? Why does he take tzaddikim? For that, we also have answers. The Torah has answers. The Torah has answers, Rabbi Ta'ekarim. Egmarai Masechet Brachot, page 62b. Describes a situation of when Akadosh Baruch Hu sends a destroyer. A malach. Where Akadosh Baruch Hu says to the angel who was destroying many people, Amar Rabbi Elazar, Amar le Akadosh Baruch Hu Malach, Tov li Rav Shebaim, Holy One, blessed is He, says to the angel, Take from me the great ones among them, for there is sufficient merit in Him to exact payment from them for many of their sins. Here, the Gemara tells us that Akadosh Baruch Hu will take, sometimes will take the tzaddikim, and the biggest tzaddikim, why? 
He says, I love my people. I don't want to kill all of them. They have sins that in essence are valued at destroying millions. But I don't want to destroy millions. So we have to take less. But at the same token, the Satan has a bill. They made this amount of sins. This amount of sins is worth millions, thousands, and so on. That's the bill. You can't just say no. There's a bill. There's, there's Torah is Torah is Amit. The Torah is a rule book for Hashem himself also. He limits himself to comply with his own Torah. So he says, okay, you're right. There's a bill of millions. Now, I could either do what the Satan wants me to do because Satan loves blood. Or, how about this? I'll take a few tzaddikim where each one of them is worth thousands or even millions himself. So he tells the Malach, you know what? Stop it. Take the best few. Because they're worth just as much as those. That one is worth a lot more than the others. There are other sources that talk about it. The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin. Page 44a. says that the men of Ai smote approximately 36 men from the army of Yeshua ben Nun. And the Chachamim say, what, you mean only 36? It says, like 36. Like 36. And then the, I'll explain this in a minute. It says, no, it really wasn't 36. It was really Yair, the son of Menashe, who was comparable to 36 of the greatest rabbis in the world, that was the majority of the Sanhedrin. Who is this Yair ben Menashe? So we go to Gemara Masechet Baba Batra, page 121b, where the Gemara talks about the story where at the time of Yeshua ben Nun, after they entered the land, Moshe Rabbeinu already has left the world. Yeshua ben Nun is the new Gdol Adol, and he brought Am Yisrael into, into Eretz Yisrael. As you would have it, Kedosh Baruch Hu tells him to go to war. They're doing well. Everything is going great. But then they see that after they've won all of these wars, there's one little battle where they lose. They lose the battle against these little people. Like, doesn't make any sense. They won against giants. But a tiny little battle they're losing. So Yeshua ben Nun, this doesn't make any sense. We lost on his battle. They find out because they committed that all of the spoils of the war is going to be for the Bet HaMikdash, for Kedusha. But this one Rasha named Achan, Achan stole some of it. And they found out, and they found out that he did it on Shabbat. So he desecrated Shabbat. As it says in the uh, book of Joshua, chapter 7, verse uh, 11, where it says, Israel sinned, they've broken the covenant to which they're bound. They've taken of the prescribed and put it in their vessels. They've stolen. They've broken faith. And they found out that they did it on Shabbat. So they had to punish this guy. They had to punish this Achan. And they ended up stoning him to death because he desecrated Shabbat, which is worse than stealing. So now the Gemara says, so because of this Rasha, 36 people died. The Gemara says, it really wasn't 36. It really wasn't 36 people that died. It was one person that died. One person, Yair ben Menashe. Who is this Yair ben Menashe? The Gemara in Masechet Baba Batra, page 121b says, look at this. There were several people, there were seven people that lived extraordinarily long lives. Extraordinarily long lives. One of them is this Yair ben Menashe. Yair ben Menashe was the son of Yosef HaTzadik, which means that he was born and he saw Yaakov Avinu was in Egypt for 210 years. On top of that, lived 40 years in a desert with Amisel, is one of the few that survived because most of the people 
that left Egypt died in the desert, but there were a few select from the Levi tribe and a few others that Akadosh Bukhu allowed them to live, Kalev ben Yefune, Yeshua ben Nun, uh, Betzalel, and Yair, and several other tzaddikim. They left. They, they left. They stayed in the world. He entered, entered Eretz Yisrael. He's there for several years already, which means that at the minimum, at the minimum, he's almost 300 years old. 210 years in Egypt, 40 years in the desert. He was obviously not zero years old at the time of uh, when he met uh, his grandfather Yaakov. When he came to to Egypt, he was already older. He was helping uh, Yosef in the uh, in the uh, kinghood over there. Point being is, he's close to 300 year old, years old minimum. When does he die? He dies when this achan makes the sin. He dies because this achan. So Kadosh Baruch Hu leaves him in the world for almost 300 years just to uproot him from the world to take his precious neshama in the world because his neshama was so holy he was such a tzaddik he was such a chacham he was the equivalent of the majority of the sanhedrin majority of the sanhedrin means a minimum of 36. minimum of 36 of the sanhedrin meaning these are 30 these are uh, the biggest rabbis in the world no 70 languages no the entire Torah and so on there's 71 members he is the majority meaning 31. He's worth at least 30, uh, I'm sorry, 36. He's worth at least 36 of the biggest tzaddikim in the world. Not 36 people, 36 tzaddikim, which means this could be literally millions. HaKadosh Baruch Hu left him in the world for almost 300 years at least. Why? Because one day I'm going to need this neshama to be the payment for this Mechalel Shabbat thief instead of killing thousands if not millions of other Jews. Here we see the Rachmanut, the mercy of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, where sometimes he takes the tzaddikim, but it's because he wants to save the rest of us in order to give us a chance to do tshuva. Hence the reason again why it is cruel to not cry out to the people with a horn telling them this tragedy that not one tzaddik, but 45 tzaddikim have died on top of all of the tzaddikim that have died in the last year, it's because we have not done tshuva. We have not done tshuva. That's why tzaddikim keep dying. It's not because the tzaddikim are excited to go to heaven only. No, it's because we have not done tshuva. Instead of killing all of us and defaulting on his promise, that he made to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, he's taking the tzaddikim rabotai. He's taking the tzaddikim because we have not done tshuva. Because everybody's worried about everybody else except themselves. He's worried about his friend that's hanging out with the wrong crowd instead of worrying about himself being with the wrong girl and he has a girlfriend before marriage. He's worried about his friends being in the wrong business instead of looking at his own business. He's worried about his friend desecrating Shabbat. He's not worried about himself wasting seed. Everyone is worried about everybody else. It's good to worry about everybody else. But don't let that fool you to thinking that you have done with tshuva. You have a long way to go and you have to start today. You have to start today. You can't just worry about everybody else. You have to worry about you. I have to worry about me. We always have to worry about ourselves. If we're constantly just thinking, no, everybody else is a rasha, everyone else is a sinner, that by default makes us the wicked ones. Because we're delusional. But how are we going to know that we're wicked? How we know that we're not doing enough if no one tells us? If everyone just gives us these these uh, lullaby type of uh, announcement that oh they're all tzaddikim they're all gone to gun eden they're all kiddush hashem okay you're right but what about the other part of the message which is why did this happen oh i've heard even big rabbis say oh we don't know the ways of hashem or why he does these things i'm sorry that's borderline heresy borderline heresy it's at the very least the dust of heresy to say we don't know why Hashem does such a thing. We have an alacha. Not just from the Rambam, but from across the board. Chachamim tell us why does a Kadosh Baruch Hu bring disaster to the world. To say we don't know why he brought the Holocaust, why he brought coronavirus, why he brings disasters, is at the very least in the best case scenario. Borderline, it's the dust of, of, of heresy. 
if not heresy mamash. But people are confused. Why? They're scared to tell people the truth. They're scared to tell people the truth. Rabotai, it's important for us to know the truth. Somebody came to Rav Gifter, Allah wa Shalom. Rav Gifter was one of the Gdolea Dor in America. He told him, Rabbi, how come you always talk with such fire and zealousness? Why don't you talk in a language that's more relevant to today's generation? Safa Meshutefet. You know, a, a language that includes all of us. Rav, Gift, Rav Gifter, excuse me, Rav Gifter responds to him with even more zealousness, saying, Safa Meshutefet, Imador. You want me to have like a united language with the generation where I'm going to be like the people that instead of talking to them in the words of Torah, but in a way that they understand, I talk to them like they talk to each other and I lower the Torah. No, no, no. Did he brings. He says that the... Uh, the uh, prophets of Hashem speak to the dead generation in the language of the generation? Aim uh, Yeshayahu. Did, did Isaiah the prophet speak to them when he said, in, in their language, when he said, your, uh, your actions will lead to you getting burned? Chapter 1 uh, in uh, the book of Isaiah, I believe it's uh, verse number 7. That your actions are going to let, lead you to get burned, meaning Hashem is going to destroy all of you because you continue doing sins. Was that in there in, in the generation's level? This is what Arav Gifter in America was telling to, to another fellow rabbi trying to get him to do tshuva. Why? He wanted him to sugarcoat things, talk to people in their language. We talk in the language of the Torah, Rabotai. And those that want to hear it, listen. But unfortunately, many people don't hear the truth either because they're looking for lies and as the Gemara says that the uh, that HaKadosh Bahu's heavenly court brings merit to those that are meritorious and obligation to those that are have obligations the wicked are going to get wicked things wicked opportunities and even more so Abali Tameh that someone that's looking to do sins someone that's looking to become impure do all types of things look for lies and so on he's looking for heretics he'll find all the heretics out there he'll find the whole lineup the whole lineup of heretics those are going to be his favorite speakers favorite rabbis favorite leaders why he's looking for sins he's looking for liars don't feel bad for the fans of the Manus Friedmans of the world and all of the Yashmuli Boteachs and the Prager Universities and all of those Reshaim. Don't be, don't be sad for them. Why? They are looking for it. They're looking for lies. Hashem gives them the liars. Simple. Would we help them if we had the chance? Of course. That's why we make the public announcements to warn people about specific people. But nonetheless, if they choose to stay there, that's on them. Why? They're looking for lies. HaKadosh Baruch gave them liars. But nonetheless, Rabotai, the question still remains. Even though the tzaddikim are going to heaven, still, why does he take the tzaddikim? Why didn't he just give us merit from the Reshaim? So the Chachamim explained to us that the Reshaim do not have the merit to die on Kiddush Hashem and bring merit to the public by their death if they're wicked they don't have the merit to die on such kiddush hashem such sanctification of a kadosh baruch Hu's name and bring merit to the public they're wicked Hashem is not going to give them such a great thing and even more so that the tzaddik's death the fact that he's now lost that actually brings merit to the public that brings merit to the public now The Sefer by Rav Yaakov ben Hanan, when you go out to war, brought an extraordinary chidush about last week's parasha, parashat Emo. He says that in parashat Emo, 
we see that uh, in different parts of the Torah that Kadosh Baruch punished the leaders first. Punished the leaders first when Am Yisrael was complaining. Kadosh Baruch punished the leaders. So why did he punish the leaders? He says because we understand that the leaders of the people are held accountable for 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 not telling and not protesting for the sins of the people specifically in damaging the Brit, the covenant and the prohibition against lying with non-jewish women and resultantly living with non-jewish women may the merciful one save us and therefore when the attribute of justice was active during the holocaust may it not rise again in israel it did not differentiate between good people and the wicked ones because as the midrash rabba says in a set book of vaikra it's uh, uh, this week's parasha parashat emor chapter 32 section 6 rabbi chanai says once every 70 years the holy one blessed is he brings a great plague to the world and destroys the mamzerim the illegitimate people and takes the good people with them so here Arab bar chanan says that first and foremost you should know when you see that there's a tragedy in the world that's killing a lot of people that's not just a rebuke on wicked people in fact it's a very big rebuke on leaders themselves for not rebuking the people on the big sins of intermarriage on the big sins of wasting seed on such big things because people simply live their life as if the sins are permissible just today somebody asked me said listen rabbi i heard in a lecture that you're not supposed to go to a uh, a mixed wedding where there's mixed dancing men and women dancing together Shemi Shmo, where the Sefer Hasidim says a person that attends such a place where there's mixed dancing of men and women whether it's a bar mitzvah a nightclub a wedding doesn't really make a difference a person that enters such a place the Sefer Hasidim says he enters a place and he comes out with all of the demons that were created in that place and they're not going to leave him and they're going to create a lot of damage and i've spoken about this extensively and chachamim have spoken about this extensively where you literally put your life at risk by attending mixed dancing weddings and events going to a nightclub your life is at risk every day you're alive is mamash like a miracle people don't understand what kind of damage they they put themselves in but nonetheless he says listen i spoke to a rabbi and he said listen to go to a place where there's mixed dancing surely there's going to be immodest women there so you don't want to go there but just to go to the chupa go to chupa before the mixed dancing starts that there's a leniency to do where did you find this leniency which sewer did you find this leniency that you're allowed to bring yourself close to a sin which sewer did you find that because it wasn't from the torah the torah is not going to allow you to desecrate a kadosh Baruch Hu's name needless to say to be a partner in a desecration of hashem's name where you're saying oh no the chupa everyone is seated separately there's no dancing but two seconds later people are going to desecrate hashem's name openly that you're allowed to you know as long as you're not part of the desecration of hashem's name directly you're absolved from it completely wrong completely wrong there is no permission whatsoever to attend a chupa where there's going to be mixed dancing wedding unfortunately i myself have fallen for this trap because i thought it was allowed also Rabotai, there's no permission uh, not anytime soon as many years ago the reality is when i first started doing my chuva i'm admitting to myself my own my own my own crimes when i first started doing chuva i thought okay i'm not going to be part of the mixed dancing i'm going to be just a uh i'm going to go to chupa what i don't want to cause any problems i don't want to fight with the people they're going to get offended offended shmended then rabotai i have to still do tshuva for it and part of my tshuva is te- warning you warning you there is no permission to go to a place where there's going to be chilul Hashem. there's no 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 permission whatsoever to even enter the building you want to go send them an envelope with some money in it and that's it now i have to go why simple they're going to desecrate a kadosh Bahu's name they're going to desecrate a Kadosh Buhu's name and, and make it as if, no, we're not doing it next to the rabbis. The rabbi left already. As if the rabbi left, but it doesn't matter that God is still here. No such thing. No such thing, Rabbi. There are even some rabbis that don't even permit mixed seating, needless to say, mixed dancing. 
but unfortunately you're always going to find some rabbi it's going to tell you no it's okay you don't want to cause any type of uh you know friction between people shlom bite problems you know people are going to get offended let them get offended it's better they're offended than akadosh Baruch who's offended but how are people going to do tshuva if you have a bunch of people like this telling them they could do a bunch of sins how are they going to do tshuva how how are they going to do tshuva Rabotai, the Midrash over here says something scary. Scary, scary, scary. Where the Midrash says, the one that Rav Yaakov Hanan brings, that Rabbi Chunai says, once every 70 years, the Holy One, blessed is He, brings a great epidemic to the world, a plague, and destroys the Mamzerim. And takes the lives of the genealogically pure Jews with them. Unfortunately, sometimes it happens where a woman cheats on her husband. And the husband doesn't know. A kid comes to the world. The husband thinks that it's his kid. He doesn't realize it's his neighbor. It's his accountant. It's somebody else's kid. That kid is a mamzer. A kadosh who says those people are wicked neshamot. They cannot marry regular Jews but how are they going to know the kids growing up like a regular person HaKadosh Baruch Hu promises that he will destroy all of them and not allow them to continue and this Gemara says once every 70 years HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings some type of plague to kill a bunch of mamzerim a bunch of wicked people a bunch of uh, uh, wicked neshamot because he cannot allow them to destroy all of Am Yisrael. but this comes from a crime this comes from promiscuity this comes from immorality how does this connect with wasting seed because the only reason why people cheat on their husband cheat on their wives are promiscuous and so on is because for the most part no one tells them how wrong it is they may know that it's not right and if my husband finds out you know he probably he'll leave me but they don't understand the type of genome that they're going to enter and never leave they don't understand the magnitude of their sin they simply don't they simply don't why no one ever talks about it no one ever tells her that because she cheated on her husband she's forbidden to stay with her husband the child is a mamzer that child cannot marry a natural a normal jew he either has to marry another mamzer or he has to marry a convert but the reality is rabutai that person his lineage will remain a mamzer forever even after 10 generations he's got a very very serious problem and HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want those people to live it all started because some rabbi that she was going to the community didn't tell her the magnitude of the sin she didn't know how bad it is Rabbi Yehuda Ftaya Allah Shalom writes in Ruchot Mesaprot which is called Minchat Yehuda in English how he spoke to a woman that was in Kafa Kela for many many years being tortured in a horrific way every second that she exists and he asked her why did you do why what happened why come you're there she said because i cheated on my husband i cheated on my husband and for each time i cheated they gave me another year in kafakila cheating is a big crime rabotai it's a big crime it's so big that a person does not even have the merit to enter Gehenom until they pay their sentence in Kafakela. Why would such a person do such a thing? Why would a Jewish person cheat? Because they never heard the magnitude of how bad it is to cheat. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sometimes has to do the job of the rabbis where he brings a plague to the world. Why did I bring all of this? These tzaddikim, obviously nothing wrong with them. What's, what am I bringing here? What does that have to do with anything? Because it all has to do with Miss teachings of the generation but even more so even more so the uh, midrash says what's the reason that hashem does this for he's also wise and he has brought evil why does he do all of this amar resh lakish resh lakish taught this that the uh akadosh baruch Hu will bring such uh, such uh, tragedy to the world and take out 
some of these uh, people, but along with them, he'll also take out the tzaddikim too. Why? So people don't know who is the wicked one and who is the rasha. Who is the wicked one? Who is the rasha? Now, where does, how does all of this start? How does all of this start? You see, Rabotai, when you have missed teachings in practically every community, you don't really know the magnitude of deen that's on the community, on the people, and so on. You don't understand. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings a coronavirus. The coronavirus, it looked like everyone was not exempt from this issue. You had religious people die. You had non-religious people die. HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought this plague. In that plague, good people died, bad people died. It's a reality. For what? For us to do tshuva. For our teachers, our rabbis, our leaders to tell us, listen, Rabotai, coronavirus is the plague that is being talked about in the Midrash, Parashat Emor, exactly a year ago. We didn't do tshuva last year in Parashat Emor when no one was pretty much allowed to go to Rabbi Shimon by Yochai Kevel. No one was able to go there. We didn't do tshuva back then. So he says, okay, so now I'm just going to take the tzaddikim. Why? Last year, I was simply hiding who the wicked ones were because I was taking everyone. There was a plague on everyone. I was taking the tzaddikim, taking the reshaim, taking everyone. You still didn't get the message. Okay, let's up the ante. Now you're just taking tzaddikim, Rabutai. Now you're just taking tzaddikim. It's getting worse, and we're still not getting the message. We're still not getting the message. Even today, today, Rabutai, today, we still have not recovered from the tragedy of a couple of days ago. Today, there was two terror attacks in Eretz Yisrael by these Imach Shimam V'Zicham Arabs that cannot live a day without seeing Jewish blood spilled. But yet, they give them full citizenship and even give them money. After they arrest them and put them in jail, they give their families money. It's the most ludicrous situation in the world. It's important that we each know that there is no going back to normal after this. You can't just go back and say, ah, you know, okay, it happened. You know, but other Hashem things will get better. We can't do that. We can't just continue going back to normal and doing nothing about it. We have to do something. We have to do a national tshuva. National tshuva, Rabotai. Because the people that we just passed, they were the best of us. They were the best of us. These were tzaddikim. These were young boys. These were people that were learning Torah, teaching Torah. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu was killing people during the coronavirus by the dozens, by the hundreds, and he was taking wicked people, the Mamzerim, he was taking good people. Why? To hide the wicked people among the righteous people. No one knew who, what, and when, and how. But the whole point was to teach us that, listen, we need to do tshuva. Now, Baruch Hashem, we have plenty of people that have done tshuva over the last year. But apparently it's not enough or even close to being enough. Why? Even if it was a few hundred every week, it's nowhere near enough. Why? If it was enough, if I was doing enough, if Tim Hashem was doing enough, if any big rabbi in the world, much greater than I could ever be, was doing enough, guess what? The tragedy at Meron would have not happened. In fact, if you were doing enough, if you were learning enough, if you were giving enough, if you were doing enough, the tragedy at Meron would have never happened. Meaning, Rabotai, in the day that there is no Bet Mikdash, it's like as if we destroyed the Bet Mikdash. When there's a tragedy among our people, we are all at fault. We none of us are doing enough. We all have to do it. That means we all have to do more tshuva. And we have to help more people do tshuva. Now, the people that passed Abutai, those are fortunate people. And then we read in Mincha, Ashrei Yoshve Betecha, Od Yaleluha Sela Ashrei Am Shekacha Lo Ashrei Am She Adonai Eloav. Those people are fortunate. Why they sit in your house, Akadosh Baruch Hu. They will continue to praise you even at your house, Kadosh Baruch Hu, forever. They're fortunate. Those are the people that have left. 
Those are the people that are fortunate because their whole life they said that God, Hashem is their God. Hashem is their God. Those are their, we don't have to worry about them. We have to worry about us. We have to worry about us that we're still here and there's tragedies happening even as we speak. Two more people got almost killed today by terrorists. More tragedies are happening by the day. The reason, Rabotai, it's not because we don't love each other, uh, because we're not uniting with the reform and the heretics. You're not allowed to love such people. It's not because we are uh, not uh, giving enough tzedakah, because trust me when I tell you, the Jewish people donate more than anybody else per capita. It's that the love that we give is wasted among everything and anything. The tzedakah that we give is going to everywhere and anywhere. Whatever. We're not being focused. We're not focused on helping the people that want to be helped. We're not focused on loving the people that we're allowed to love. We're not focused on giving for the things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves. We're simply spreading and doing everything as if we're like hippies. Love everyone, give to everyone, kumbaya, united world, and you'll even have some rabbis say, rabbis, call themselves orthodox, say, no, in our synagogue we have Jews and non-Jews, different religions, Christians, everyone attends our synagogue. That's not a synagogue. Maybe United Nations, but it's not a synagogue. Why? In a synagogue, you have people that pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and they are all Jews. Or people that are in the process of becoming Jews. Not people that are praying to a different God or a different uh, deity of other kinds or some other faith. No. That's not in our synagogues. But today people want to be united with everyone, love everyone, and accept everyone. But that's not what the Torah says. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says in Parashat Kedoshim, Kedoshim tiyu ki Kadosh ani. You be holy because I am holy. Over there he selected us specifically to be unique and separate from the nations. Doesn't mean we have to hate the nations. Doesn't mean we have to persecute the other nations. In fact, we have to be a light to the nations. But we can't be like the other nations. We can't accept the other nations as if they're just like one of us. No, we have to help our people just like they help their people. We have to make sure that we are priority number one. You have a friend, a neighbor, a classmate, an employee, whatever, that is a Jew and is desecrating Shabbat versus you have another person that's really nice, but he's not Jewish, but he doesn't keep Shabbat. He doesn't keep anything. He doesn't believe in God. Guess what? Your obligation is to the Jew, not to the Gentile. Why? Because that's the reality. If you've helped all of the Jews around you and there's no more Jews left, because you've helped everybody. You're the little Mashiach in your community. And there's, you know, a few non-Jews that you want to help. I hope. Go ahead. Do it. But unfortunately today, because everyone wants to spread everywhere. Why? Because they figure, listen, Jews, even if I market to them and I teach them, how many can I get to? A few million. Non-Jews, there's billions. The market is huge. That's why you'll see certain organizations only focus on helping non-Jews. That's not the right way. It's not the right way. We're supposed to publicize Torah for whoever wants it. Priority number one, the Jewish people. But the mentality that we have today is that we have to be accepting of everyone. Everyone is equal. It's not true. Everyone is not equal. If you have one person that wants to keep Torah and Mitzvot, wants to learn but doesn't have any money, the other person is richer than rich, but doesn't care about Torah. You have to help the person that wants to learn Torah, not the person that hates Torah, even if he has more money. Yeah, but what about if I help him and I get a lot of money to open a yeshiva and help more people? You have to help the person that wants to be helped. You can't go and chase the heretic just because he has more money. Now, if you have equal opportunity, everyone wants help, help everybody. But that's what happens. People are selective. Selective. And they are not focusing their love for the people the right way. Same thing when it comes to money. People just want to donate to any campaign that's out there. Hey, Rabbi, there's a new campaign. Maybe you could publicize it. Oh, uh, last I checked, I don't have any new campaigns. Same thing that we've had for the last few months. No, no, somebody else is, uh, has a campaign raising money for the people that died, raising money for the new zoo, raising money for the new synagogue, raising money for this. Like, why would I market somebody else? Well, it's a good cause. How do I know it's a good cause? 
How do I know it's a good cause? You know how many donor frauds there are there? You know how many campaigns are complete fraud? How come you don't focus on one thing? And this, by the way, Rabotai, a lot of times I see people failing at their chuva, failing at their conversion, failing at their job, failing at a lot of things. One of the main reasons for people's failure and their servitude of Hashem, needless to say, in their life is because they're not focused. They spread themselves everywhere. They listen to 5, 10, 15 different rabbis. They read 10 different books at the same time. They spread their wealth everywhere. Everywhere they talk to, they just go anywhere. That splurgy is not good. You have to be focused in life. You have to be focused in life. And when you spread yourself too thin, you're going to get nowhere. You'll be a person that knows a little bit about a lot of things, but nothing, uh, not a lot about anything. That's not a valuable person. That's just a person that knows how to hold a conversation, but it's not a valuable person. It's a socialite. If you want to succeed in life, you have to focus. As a people, whether we are already Jews or we're aspiring to become Jews or we're looking to become the best Gentiles in the world, the righteous Noahides that are called Chasdeu Motaulam. If you want to have a chance in succeeding, we have to focus our efforts all of our efforts to learn only the emit all of our efforts to only publicize the emit all of our strength to only do what akadosh Baruch Hu said and that's it all of our efforts whatever time we have that we need to work to make a living by all means do it but all spare time focus on living publicizing and doing what akadosh Baruch Hu said that's what we have to do that's the only way that we're going to get ourselves to finally be focused enough to get gain the strength to do real tshuva and even more so to be a light to the people around us because as long as your wife sees that you're splurging everywhere you are everywhere you're listening to everyone how can she take you seriously how could she take you seriously? As long as your husband sees that one day you're doing the chala with this rabbanit, the next day you're praising that rabbi, the next day you're praising some different rabbanit, the next day you are the rabbanit, every day you're somewhere else, you're like a socialite in the religious world. How could he take you seriously? Every day you're doing something, you're promoting something else every two seconds. How could anyone take you seriously? Needless to say, how could HaKadosh Baruch Hu take us seriously if one day we are for the Torah and the next day we're for the heresy? How? How? How can we do it? We as a people have to focus. Focus in one direction. Focus in one direction. There's a reason why the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin says, in the time the Mashiach is going to come, it's going to come at a time where everyone is going to have to choose a side. Do shekulo zakai, do shekulo chayav. Either completely righteous or completely wicked. We all have to make that decision. Either we're all going to become kiruv tools to help everyone around us, including ourselves, or we're just going to be excluded from any blessing. Why? Because that's what's needed right now. Rabutayda is disaster after disaster coming to our people and none of us are doing enough. None of us are doing enough. So for those that want to do something, there's a lot to do. You can share the lectures, you could donate for the lectures, you could donate your time, your skill, you could do a lot of different things. But the point is that we each have to do something. It starts with our tshuva. Don't just think that kiruv by itself is enough because if you are not doing tshuva yourself, you're not fixing yourself, your kiruv is not going to be effective. So we each have to continue working on ourselves. And in addition to that, and as part of that, we have to help the people around us, even if we don't know them, even if we don't like them. But if they're Jews, if they're part of our community, if they're part of our people, we're obligated to sound the horn. We're obligated to cry out and tell them, disaster has come to Am Yisrael day after day, night after night, thousands of people are dying and no one has told you the reason. Let me tell you the reason. The reason is because we have not done enough tshuva. We have not cared enough about you to do tshuva. 
Because if we did, you would have already done it. If each one of us cared enough about Kalal Israel to at the very least commit to helping 10 people do tshuva, all of Am Yisrael would have already done tshuva in the last year. If every Jew, if every Jew would have cared, every religious Jew would have cared enough and helped 10 people do tshuva in one year, all of Am Yisrael would have done tshuva. But unfortunately, we're all preoccupied with our own dealings, our own addictions, our own desires, our own troubles, our own everything. And yes, it's very easy to get addicted to your own problems and your own issues and so on. But remember, that Jew that desecrates Shabbat, that Jew that's intermarried, that Jew that is not eating kosher, he's also part of your problems. He's also part of your problems and he'll continue being part of your problems. And those tzaddikim that just were uprooted from the world and taken to Gan Eden, we don't have to worry about them. They're in Gan Eden. We have to worry about ourselves because that's Akadosh Baruch Hu telling us time ran out, but instead of making even a bigger disaster of more people, I bought you some more time by uprooting 45 tzaddikim. How much more time do we have before the next tragedy? I don't know. But I do know that if we do not start doing something about helping Am Yisrael do tshuva in a hurry, start keeping Shabbat in massive scale, and not just one Shabbat a year, every Shabbat, protect their breed, but not just one time and for one month and it's okay and you're a hero, all the time. Eat kosher inside of the house and outside of the house. Never attend or even have the audacity to think you're allowed to attend these mixed dancing weddings and so on. Never be nonchalant about another Jew that's desecrating Shabbat or is dishonest in business. You see someone that's dishonest, say something. Warn people. Warn people. Go to the rabbi say, this guy's a thief. He is doing such and such. Don't just stay quiet about everything. You have to warn people. Why? By simply allowing the criminals to continue go without anyone answering them is allowing them to grow, allowing them to desecrate Hashem's more even more and it's getting worse. So to give you a little bit of motivation for whoever is going to be motivated by this, whoever is not, is not. They have your own, your own ways. You can do your own ways. We have, Baruch Hashem, as I told you, have reached well over a million, million and a half people already with the movie of Tikkun Abrit. We're going to, Bezat Hashem, do even more. We're going to look to do a lot more. We're going to be mailing out different uh, cards that we have to Bezat Hashem as many people as we could possibly afford. Anyone that wants to be part of these campaigns can be. Anyone who doesn't does not have to. It's not an obligation. It's just a suggestion. Anyone that wants to give them out themselves We'll send it to you for free. We'll send you a few hundred for free. You can give them out yourself, but don't just put the whole batch in one place and leave because that's just wasting them. Take 10, 20, give them out in your community. This is only for people that are local to us in America to save on the shipping, unless you want to pay for the shipping. Anyone that wants to pay for them is more than welcome to. You can buy them on our store and you can pay for them. They're not very much, 10 cents each. If you don't have the money or you don't feel like paying for it, you want to get it for free, we'll send you a few hundred of them for free. You can give them out in your community. And this, we also have a new uh, uh, bookmarks, same version, but just with bookmarks and a message on them. So we'll send, them, send you out a few hundred for free to give them out in your community. This is one thing that you can help people in your community. They can watch one of the two major movies that we've made to help entice people both in the religious community and non-religious community. Hasidic community, modern Orthodox community, uh, you know, a secular community, any community that has simply a computer or whatever can benefit out of this. I could send you these for free and you could watch, you could uh, give them out in your community, put uh, in different places, give them out to people in your hand, but try to give them out as soon as possible because if you just stack them in your house and it stays there for six months, that's not a mitzvah. It's actually a, a sin because somebody else could be giving them out at that time. So if you want it, you could just send me a message. I'll send you them uh, for free. You want to pay for them? You're more than welcome to. You want to sponsor this? Uh, you could do it. We're going to start off with a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand for free. Uh, that whoever wants to sponsor it or whoever wants to be a part of it, we're going to send out a hundred thousand for free for whoever wants to do it. So, it's big enough 
to at the very least 100,000 opportunities to help people do tshuva. That's number one. Uh, number two, for New York specifically, New York specifically, we made a new flyer that's going to have the wake up call for the cash advance business because I believe over there is the biggest epidemic as far as the cash advance business. This will be in New York over the next uh, couple of days. Anyone that wants to give these out, to give them on your communities, uh, to wake people up, to leave the cash advance business that's destroying the economy and the Jewish community's name, by all means, let us know. We'll get these out to you. Uh, these are different flyers for it. Again, we'll send you a couple of hundred for free and you can give them out. Last thing is, also we have a uh, new idea. New idea we're going to try to implement. And we have a, anyone that wants to host an event. Host an event in their community to show the movies. Either the Tikkun Abrit movie or the Hashem Took Back His Millions movie or both movies. But in a short period of time, you want to host, you want to get... 10, 50, 100, 200 of the people in your community to watch the event. We are going to try to make it easier for you. We are going to send you a projector. A projector with a USB that you could put into the system. And all you got to do is simply press play. Connect it, press play if you want to have even more sound connected to a bigger speaker, but it comes with a speaker already. A projector, and you'll be able to host an event in your community. We're not giving it to you for obviously for forever. Give it to you, show the event, and then send it back to us, and then we'll send it to the next person. So we already bought a few projectors for people that want to host these events but don't have an ability to do it. This way, you can invite a bunch of people, and they can watch the movies on a big screen, and you can maybe get them some pizza, or as long as it's kosher, or popcorn, or whatever it is, to host an event in your community to get as many young boys, girls, old boys, girls, middle-aged boys, girls, doesn't really make much of a difference. Get as many Jews as possible to attend. And obviously you have to invest some time into marketing it in your community. We'll send you the equipment. You'll have a brand new projector with a USB connected and you'll be able to show it on a wall. Uh, if you want to get yourself a screen, you can get yourself a screen, but it works perfectly on a wall. I tested it last night. And you'll have a brand new projector sent to you as soon as you're finished you send it back to us and we'll send it to the next person in essence you're uh getting it uh, uh renting it for free uh if you want to give us some donations for it you're welcome to you don't have any money no problem we'll send it to you for free we'll, we'll find somebody to pay for it either way get people to come that's the key that's the key this is some of the things we can do you could host events in your community for people to watch the movie. You could host a, events for people to listen to the lectures together. You could do a lot of different things. We have some ideas. I'm sure some of you have some ideas. But you have to do something. Because the destroyer is here. And Rabotai, we have to do something before it gets worse. Bezat Hashem, this will encourage each and every single one of us to do something to do something about it to do something about it because there is a tragedy there is a, a huge tragedy and unfortunately it's what we're doing is not enough what we're doing is not enough so we have to help Am Yisrael do tshuva the last but not least actually that I almost forgot is we also have a uh, Shavuot coming up now we weren't planning on doing another food distribution because the pesach one that we did was a uh, very very big one it went uh, much higher than budget but nonetheless for the sake of the neshamot that 45 neshamot that passed away uh we're going to start a campaign uh in the next day or so uh, to raise money to give money to the poor to eat on Shavuot that's coming up in a couple of weeks anyone that's already inclined to donate now can donate now on the website and just tell me on the notes that you're donating for the sake of uh, uh, Shavuot campaign uh, but that's also something that will do this campaign and the whole craziness that goes along with it of distributing food and, and, and money and whatever it is to help feed the poor for Shavuot uh, we're going to start the campaign. This is going to be specifically for the merit of those neshamot. Not, uh, you know, we're not going to uh, uh, send those particular families the food because I'm sure somebody else is already doing that, but even more so because there are people that are even more in need because they're obviously very poor. So we'll do something for the merit of those precious neshamot that have left us. But again, we have priority number one 
is to help the neshama of Am Yisrael do tshuva. Priority number two is to help the bodies eat. If we can't do one without the other, we need both. And that's why our organization does both. These are some of the things that we have as a suggestion. You want to be part of it? You're welcome to. You want to do something on your own? Do something on your own. The key, the key from all of what we learned today is number one, do something. Stop pretending that everything is okay. And chas v'shalom, don't say, shalom aleich nafshi, that everything is okay and everything will just pass. Don't do one of those things. Don't go back into the norm pretending that everything is just going to go away and everything is back to being normal. Don't go back to normal. Do something. Do something. Do more tshuva, do more kiruv, do more chesed, but do something. So this is very critical. Number one. Number two most important lesson is to know this did not happen for no reason. All of the tragedies that we had as a people, all of the tragedies that the whole world has had is because of our sins. It's not because of accidents. It's not because Hashem is testing us. It's not a test. When people are dying by the, by the thousands, it's not a test, Rabotai. It's not a test. This is the actual situation. We have to understand that we have a very serious problem. HaKadosh Baruch is not happy with us. And we have to do more tshuva to get on his good side. We can't just pretend everything is okay. We have to realize it's not okay. But it can become okay if we listen to what the Rambam says, what the Puskim say, which is to do tshuva. We sound the horn, we cry out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we start praying to Hashem, we stop whining about nonsense, we start worrying about Am Yisrael, not just about ourselves being selfish. Worry about Am Yisrael, remove yourself from yourself. Start worrying about Am Yisrael and you'll see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will bring more mercy to all of our lives. Be'ezad Hashem, this will wake up the people. Please watch this as many times as you need to to be inspired by it but even more so share it with as many people as you can so we can get the message out there because the Mishnah in Avot says in a place that there's no leader you be the leader we're not really interested in being leaders we're not really interested in being the uh, the horn of the people but unfortunately if nobody else wants to do it at the very least let Hashem use us as the donkey or as the korban to, to deliver the message that he wants whether it's a uh, people like it or don't like it is not really our concern the concern is to get to the people that are looking for the truth if the people that are looking for the truth at least have an opportunity to hear it then Bezad Hashem these disasters will just simply be a bad memory that we learn from and we move beyond because now we're focused on sanctifying a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name instead of unfortunately doing uh, the, the contrary so Bezad Hashem, this will get out there, this will, uh, will be uh, learned, and Bezad Hashem, people will get the message to do tshuva. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.